This is a production of Cornell University. Well, good afternoon and welcome and welcome back. We hope you all had a great spring break, got a chance to relax, get some sleep, eat some good food, and just have some fun as well. Uh, what I'd like to do, I'm doing a little informal poll. I'd like to find out where you did go for spring break. So if you get your clickers out, did you go to home, Florida, Mexico or the Caribbean, Europe, or some other place? So tell me what you did. Oh, oh I'm sorry. It was up there a moment ago. All right. Go for it. What are we waiting for? Hmm. There we are, and we're done. Okay, terrific. All right. All right, so I guess we're not going to do that poll, so we'll go on to the next situation here. Okay, let's try it again, okay? Where'd you go for spring break? I didn't know this would create such a buzz here today. All right. Let's see how you guys did. So most people went home and a lot of people did other. I'm, just, I'm sure that was skiing and other good places. Okay, excellent. Just a quick question for you. I know we all ate well during the break. How many minutes would you need to run to burn off the calories of cheeseburgers and a large fry, okay? It's A, B, C, D, E. I don't know why the letters disappeared, but anyway. Let me know what you think there. Strange things are happening here today. Well, the correct answer is actually 138 minutes you need to run. And let me show you what that really translates out to be. If you look at exercise equivalents, and this comes from a book by Platkin called The Diet Detective's Countdown. If you look at a large banana, a person who's 155 pounds running a 12-minute mile, which isn't very fast, by the way, <coughs> um, actually needs about 13 minutes to uh, exercise equivalents to burn the calories in one banana. And you can see down the list how long it really takes to burn off the calories from uh, lots of foods that we eat. So the bottom line here is exercise well and eat cautiously. Okay, uh, we have papers back for you today. Most of you got the computer diet evaluation paper back already at the, at the midterm, but the range was 72 to 100. The mean was 96 with a standard deviation of about 4.2. 38 students received a grade of 100. And I wanted you to see what the grade spread looked like. Most people did very, very well. The folks who didn't do so well, and that, this is very respectable, by the way, but probably made some errors in directions, didn't do some things that we asked to do, and that's probably why they got scored lower. Okay? Now, what about the midterm? Midterm was a little disappointing. The range was 37, ugh, to 96, with a mean of about 77 and a standard deviation of about 11. Now, before you get all upset, hang on, okay? Here's the range. So many people did quite well, but we had a, a, a number of people kind of in this range which took the mean down a little bit. Only one person here, a couple people here. So, here's what we're gonna do. If you have a question or a concern about the grading of your paper or your exam, 
please submit the question in writing. Don't run up after class and say, I just have a quick question about this. Please write it down. Tell us what you want to know about it, and we will regrade the exam and give it back to you. Now, we'd like to have all your questions for regrades in by Tuesday. That's a week from today, April 1st, okay? We will not regrade papers after that time. So when you come up to pick up your papers at the end of class today, your, your exams, and you look over your computer diet evals, if you have any questions, we'd be happy to regrade, but please make sure it's in writing and submit it back to myself or Dr. Meller or any of the TAs, and we will regrade it and get it back to you. And again, April 1st is the deadline, so one week from today. Okay? All right. Now, let's take a look at some food stories in the news. And you're going to see in some of these video clips some things we've already talked about, some things we're going to talk about, and some things that unfortunately we're not going to get to. But I want to give you a sense of sort of where we've been and where we're going. I've seen seven-year-olds that are 200 pounds. Millions of overweight kids at risk of serious disease. Helping kids overcome food allergies with small doses of the food that could kill them. seen seven-year-olds that are 200 pounds. Millions of overweight kids at risk of serious disease. Helping kids overcome food allergies with small doses of the food that could kill them. We're looking this week at food safety. In a CBS News poll, about four out of ten Americans said they've had food poisoning at one time or another. That's tens of millions of people. The FDA does a great job but they're starved for resources, and it's showing up uh, at a lot of the inspections for food. Peanut butter contaminated with salmonella, green onions infected with E. coli, and last year's E. coli spinach contamination that sickened hundreds. It's gimmick or for real, we're talking about fortified foods. You've seen the ads for items like orange juice with calcium and cereals with omega-3s, but are they really good for your health or just some kind of a marketing come on? Here's the trap. If the amount of partially hydrogenated oil is less than four-tenths of a gram per serving, the manufacturer can legally claim zero grams trans fat. I think it's bad that New York City just banned trans fat. I may get skinnier, but they've just taken all the flavor out of food. I think it's great. Um, nobody chooses to eat trans fats. It's called DHA. You can't taste it, you can't see it, but some say this magical fatty acid could warn off all sorts of debilitating diseases. More than two-thirds, two-thirds of Americans are either obese or overweight. I did not care when I was eating that double cheeseburger. The only thing I was thinking about was, am I going to get another one? Salt, white flour, the kind of foods that are causing that heart, flavorful, disease, heart disease. That people might like to eat. Cancer. <laughs> well, listen, everything's Constipation. A risk. Constipation? <laughs> That's, do we really need to ring the alarm bell for that? <laughs> there is a toxic effect of aspartame, and I'm not saying that there is. This, the jury is still out. But if there is, the effects are probably going to be greater the smaller your body weight, so that children would be more susceptible than adults. I'm concerned that chemicals in the plastic might leach into the food, and that might be harmful for the baby. Uh, condiments, for example, such as ketchup, have lots of salt in it. You squirt that onto your food, you think you're still eating healthy, but you're actually getting quite a bit of sodium. Those food additives with complicated names and a simple job. Now a new study finds those ingredients that add longevity and color can ignite hyperactivity in children. More calories from soft drinks than from food. What would happen if your food could tell you how healthy it was before you bought it? When given a choice between a product with stars and one without stars, Customers consistently choose the one with stars. See, myth number two is dark chocolate is a health food. Dark chocolate is not a health food, but it does have health-promoting properties in a larger amount. But don't use it as an excuse to overconsume. People do indeed become addicted to caffeine very rapidly, and they also withdraw from caffeine very rapidly. One and a half million people this year will hear the words from their doctors, you have cancer. Millions more are working to prevent getting the disease, and a new study combines research from thousands of other studies and the recommendations are specific here remember kids nothing gives you energy and get up and go to play an hour a day like high fructose corn syrup 
some accurate, some not, but that's the barrage of activities and information that we all get as consumers on the 6 o'clock news or various other stations like the Food Channel and others. So we've covered a number of these issues in class already. We'll get to some food safety issues and additives and other things coming up soon, but I just wanted to give you a little bit of a preview. We've completed, obviously, the first section of the course. We've addressed food choices, the food system, and I think Dr. Mellon did an outstanding job of addressing the nutritional aspects of food. So now we've, we've given you some information on selecting nutritious diets and interpreting the popular nutrition literature. So in the second module of this course, we're really going to look at the importance of food science and technology and how it influences food products. And why is this important? Because we're all consumers, and most of us, as we talked earlier in the course, really don't have a very good understanding of where our food comes from and what change, why the form of it has changed, why the issues are out there. So hopefully we'll provide you with some uh, information in that regard. So let's talk today about food processing and preservation very important aspect of food science. And if we look at the issues, if we look at these foods, and we look at storage life of foods, we can see that perishable commodities like meat, fish, poultry, fruits, and leafy vegetables will last a very, very short period of time. And it's no surprise to anybody in this room. You leave a product like this out at 70 degrees Fahrenheit, and it's going to last a day or two max, maybe even a shorter time. If you look at some of the root crops and the dried fruits and the seeds and the salted and dried and smoked meats, you can keep those for a lot longer. Why is that? Because moisture, and we'll talk about this in a minute, is one of the things that helps to encourage the growth of bacteria that are present that will stimulate uh, enzymatic reactions and so on and so forth, resulting in a short shelf life food. If we look at the perishability of food, we can modify it through some preservation technologies. Again, no revelation to anybody in this room. And we all want fresh foods. We all want foods that are picked right from the garden. And, and that's, a, that's a kind of a given now with consumers in our country and, and abroad as well. Oftentimes, when we apply a preservation method, we're going to change the form of that product. And we're going to change sometimes the nutritional component of that product. And we're going to change the value, maybe, of that product as well. If you look at this very complex diagram, and I'm not going to spend a lot of time on it, but we can take a highly perishable food like meat, fish, poultry, many high uh, water content fruits and vegetables, and we can do something with them to convert those highly perishable foods into a stable commodity. And we do that all the time. By canning, freezing, dehydration, or irradiation, uh, we can convert that into a, a form that will last us for quite a while. We can also take that perishable form, uh, that stable form, and do something to it, like press those oil seeds or grind, that, uh, grind those uh, grains into flour and create a perishable form of that product. So clearly, the point of this graphic is that through a variety of techniques, we can easily change the form of foods. And we often do this in, in order to uh, uh, satisfy consumer needs and wants. So what are the major causes of food deterioration and spoilage? I think we need to look at this before we really get to why we process foods, how we process foods, and what some of the current technologies are that address these issues. So let's take a look at what uh, causes food deterioration and spoilage. And obviously, you've got most of the slides in front of you. So if I ask you, you'll, you'll know what the answers are. But certainly, probably the main cause of food deterioration and spoilage are microorganisms, bacteria, yeasts, and moles. Clearly, these organisms are responsible for a large portion of food deterioration they can attack virtually all food constituents, OK? And they break down or degrade those food constituents and use those components to grow. And as they grow, they produce metabolic byproducts. And some of those byproducts come from fermented sugars, come from uh, digesting or hydrolyzing proteins. The starches and fats get hydrolyzed. And clearly, many of these organisms produce acid and gas. So if you leave something in your fridge for a long period of time, how do you first detect that there's a spoiled food or a food that's deteriorating rapidly in your refrigerator? You smell it. Oh my god, what is that awful odor? And that's why. Because the bacteria are breaking down food constituents and producing metabolic byproducts, which, again, again going to render that product 
pretty inedible. Unless you're starving, you're probably not going to eat that food, okay? Now, if we look at bacteria, spoilage does occur in the refrigerator. And the organisms that cause that spoilage are called psychrotrophs, okay? Psychrotrophs are organisms that have the optimum growth temperature between 68 and 86 degrees Fahrenheit. And, but, but they can grow at colder temperatures, usually less than 44. Now, just a quick poll. What's, what should be the temperature of your home refrigerator right now? What's the temperature of your home? What should the temperature of your home refrigerator be? Can somebody help me with this? 38 degrees is probably a good answer. Less than 40 is the correct answer. What we can say? 34 is a little cold, but colder the better. But remember, if, you, if you've got some products in there, like fruits and vegetables, what's going to happen to them, possibly? If they freeze, then you're probably going to have a worthless salad because you're going to have pretty limp lettuce and, and frozen vegetables don't do well in, in that setting. Okay, and we'll talk about that in a bit. So about 40 or lower, and 38 would be very good. And if you if you all have your uh, temperatures, your refrigerated temperatures set at 38, you're going to be in great shape. But the two genera of spoilage bacteria that operate at refrigerator temperatures that are psychotrophs are pseudomonas, or we call them pseudomonads, and enterococci, or enterococcus genera, okay? So these are the two main ones that cause spoilage at refrigerator temperatures, okay? And remember the, the psychotrophic uh, facts here that these organisms have optima between 68 and 86, but they have mechanisms that allow them to grow at colder temperatures less than about 44.6 or about 7 degrees C, okay? Okay, if we look at other types of organisms, yeasts, we don't think about these very much because they are larger than bacteria, and they don't usually cause tremendous amounts of problem, but I'm sure all of us have had foods that we consume that have had some yeast deterioration. Yeasts are pretty hardy. They can grow in a wide variety of pH ranges. They can grow in, in sucrose levels up to 50 to 60 percent. That's pretty dang high. Also, they can grow into up to about 18% ethanol or alcohol. Now, if you've ever had orange juice that's been sitting around for a while, and it gets a little fizzy, and it gets a little tangy, you get this little bite to it. Anybody ever experienced that? Yeah, of course. That's yeast deterioration of those products. Why? Because yeasts can grow in acid products like fruit juices, like salad dressings and yogurts, etc. But that's the product that you often will see problems occurring, especially if you leave the orange juice in the fridge for a long period of time and then pull it back out. You're going to see some yeast deterioration of that product. What about moles? And this is something everybody has seen. They're multicellular. They're filamentous. The important piece here is that they need air to grow, okay? Moles are aerobic, and we'll come back and talk about that in a minute. But obviously, you know when something has mold growth on it because it's visible. You can see this uh, filamentous tangled mass of very colorful and often smelly uh, hyphae that are out there. And again, if you look, most, most of the time you see mold growth on fruits and vegetables. You can see it on dairy products like cheeses, uh, grain products like nuts, etc., and other foods. And the sad part of this and the important part of this is that uh, many moles produce mycotoxins, and these mycotoxins are, again, a, a byproduct of their metabolism, but these mycotoxins can be carcinogenic and mutagenic. So clearly the most important one is called aflatoxin, produced by the mold Aspergillus flavus. It grows on peanut-type grain products, and clearly we want to be sure that the temperature and the moisture content of where we store the grain is appropriate to prevent the growth of this particular mold, okay? So again, these mycotoxins are pretty nasty stuff, and we want to try to avoid them by, again, storing our foods at appropriate temperatures. Now, people always ask, what about mold growth on cheese? And I think the conventional wisdom is, visually look at your food. If it's well overgrown with mold, what are you going to do with it? You're going to throw it away. When in doubt, throw it out, okay? You don't want to fool around. But if it's just a little bit and the product has been kept refrigerated, you've got a little bit of mold growth on your cheese, you can cut off about a half an inch to an inch away from that product, throw the mold, mold uh, contaminated piece away, and you're all set. 
if it's a liquid product, or it's a soft or semi-soft cheese or yogurt or sour cream, throw the product away, okay? Just a little consumer tip for everybody here uh, about uh, mold growth and uh, deterioration. Another mechanism for food deterioration is natural food enzymes. And I think most of you are well aware of the fact that these enzymes, which occur naturally in all products, are um, complex proteins, they're biological catalysts, and certainly they are very, very specific in their actions. They operate in, in very prescribed ways, and obviously they're not used up in the process, okay? Some very, very basic stuff that you probably all are well aware of. Most of these enzymes have very optimum requirements for pH and temperature, and they operate in chemical systems, and obviously they can accelerate the rate of chemical reactions. So think about how this plays out in a real food product. You've all seen this occur, right? Banana ripening. Natural food enzymes are responsible for the ripening of lots of fruits and vegetables out there. And recognize that for every 10 degrees C rise in temperature, reaction rate doubles. So if we leave a product like this out in a warm atmosphere, in a warm environment, what happens? Reaction rates go nuts and your banana deteriorates quite rapidly. Now we can inactivate these enzymes with chemicals or heat, other ways to do it, again in different systems, so recognize that we can slow the rate of chemical reaction as well, okay? All right, let's take a look at another cause of food deterioration and spoilage. And we don't think about this one very often because it's not a real issue for the most part in the U.S., but it is a huge issue internationally, and that is insects and rodents. Five to 10% of the U.S. grain crop is destroyed by insects and rodents. That's pretty large. And when you think about what it is worldwide, and I'll show you some numbers in a minute, it's pretty staggering. And it's not so much what the insect or the rodent eats, it's what those organisms, if you will, defile the product and make it uh, inedible for a lot of reasons. An insect will destroy the integrity of that grain product and expose it to higher humidity, to temperatures, to bacteria and mold growth, and then you're going to get other deteriorative factors working in concert with the fact that the insect destroyed the integrity of the product. In terms of rats, mice, and birds, certainly their bodily contact, their fecal material and urine that contaminates product, none of us in this room want to consume any of those. So clearly, they destroy a lot of products. If you look at rodents and mice in particular, the Food and Ag Organization of the UN estimates that one-fifth to one-half of the world's food supply, now think about this, Dr. Miller talked about a little bit about sustainability and about food sources around the world, and he'll come back and talk a little bit more about that later, but recognize that if one-fifth to one-half of the world's food supply never reaches people due to losses from rodents, that's incredible. Oftentimes we raise enough food, but it deteriorates and spoils before it gets to the people who really need it the most. And I think Haiti is a good example right now of that happening. We've got food rotting in warehouses, and rodents are all defiling that product, and there's people starving, you know, in the next town. That's a fact. Uh, again, what you see here is very interesting. A little mouse had tunneled right through a roll of white bread. So we want to avoid those kinds of things. So let's, pull, let's do another poll here. Psychotrophs have an optimum temperature, growth temperature between what and what? Okay, let's see. Fantastic, because D is the correct answer, between 68 and 86 Fahrenheit. That's the correct answer. Okay, let's look at temperature. Now, we use temperature as a mechanism to slow down the deteriorative process. But extremes in temperature, either excessive heat or excessive cold, will accelerate the deterioration process. And let's take a look at this. 
Excessive heat certainly accelerates it. Why? Because microorganisms grow more rapidly, usually the warmer the temperatures are, given a, a, a finite endpoint, of course. Reaction rates of enzymatic reactions are accelerated. You denature proteins when you increase the heat substantially. And foods dry out. Obviously, moisture is removed. And when that happens, food becomes very uh, inedible. Vitamins get destroyed. And emulsions break. If you have a water in oil emulsion and you raise the temperature accordingly, you could indeed cause that emulsion to break and those two phases, the water and the oil, to separate. Okay? So you want to avoid that by maintaining proper temperatures during uh, food storage, during food transportation, etc. Now what about excessive cold? Excessive cold will also cause emulsions to break. And those of you who have tried to freeze milk have probably seen that. If you freeze milk, what happens when you thaw it back out again? You get all this stuff in the bottom that kind of shakes around and stuff. Emulsion's breaking a bit. The protein will be denatured. It'll curdle a bit. Um, obviously, excessive cold is going to freeze some fruits and vegetables. And many fruits and vegetables are what we call, will, are susceptible to what we call chill injury. So you want to keep bananas not in the refrigerator, because what happens when you put them in the refrigerator? They get brown and speckly and spotty, etc. Not good because bananas get chill injured. Also, when this happens, you're going to develop off colors, surface pitting, and decay will begin to set in. So these will accelerate some of the deteriorative factors that go on. Also, when we freeze fruits and vegetables, and you've all seen this with your lettuce, what happens when a highly um, high moisture content fruits, fruit or vegetable freezes? Uh, it loses its cellular elasticity, its turgor, and uh, it's just really pretty inedible because it's such high water content, and nobody's going to consume it. So clearly, we've got to protect against excessive cold temperatures. What about moisture? Now, we all know that if you live in South Florida in the summertime, the humidity levels, the moisture levels, are excessive. Well, again, moisture is required for microbial growth. An excessive amount can certainly accelerate those reactions. And also in high moisture content areas, we see products that begin to lump and cake. Anybody ever had popcorn in a highly humid atmosphere? What's it taste like? It tastes like cardboard. It's pretty blah because the moisture just ruins that sensory experience. Also, we can see from excessive moisture, surface modeling, crystallization, and things start to stick together. Salt, sugar, other things like that become very difficult to use because of the high humidity levels. So how does this play out for a packaged product? I'm thinking of a breakfast cereal product here. Think about the difference between a corn flake and maybe a sugar frosted flake. You see any differences in those pictures? The difference is in the package that those products are in. In the high sugar product, what's going to happen here is if it's a very humid environment, what's going to happen to the water in the air? It's going to get sucked into that product, and it's really going to be not very good. And we have to protect that with multiple vapor barriers okay, to prevent that moisture from getting into the product. And Dr. Hotchkiss, our packaging uh, guru here on Cornell campus, we'll talk about that a little bit later. But for a product like this, we don't have to take as many moisture barrier steps to protect it from uh, the humidity in the air. Let's look at dryness. If you have extremely dry conditions, if we're in Phoenix, Arizona in the middle of the summer when the air temperature is about 125 and humidity maybe 5 or 6 or 7 percent, excessive dryness is going to cause foods that have moisture to crumble, to, to, to lose their structure, and their taste and color is often affected. Very, very important here. Another deteriorative factor that we need to consider is what? Air or oxygen. Because oxygen has some tremendous deleterious effects on food. Many microorganisms need oxygen to grow. So if oxygen's present, that's going to happen. Moles, certainly, I mentioned a few moments ago, are aerobic, so you, they need oxygen to grow. And by and large, what happens with oxygen is we cause chemical oxidation of the food, especially to, to vitamins A and C, to food lipids. Fats become oxidized. 
And if you've ever put a piece of fish in the fridge or in the freezer for a long period of time, or you've put some products out and ex you open the bag and you expose it to air, what happens to the product after a while? It gets a little rancid and oxidative rancidity occurs and colors get affected, flavors get affected, and our food deteriorates, okay? So clearly all of these factors have a play in our, our situation. So how do, we, how do we exclude oxygen, still have fresh products, and still maintain some semblance of shelf life? Well, we do it through a technique called modified atmosphere packaging. Anybody ever heard of modified atmosphere packaging before? Anybody? A couple people? Nobody? Modified atmosphere packaging is a very interesting innovation because what we do is we take a package of food and we change the gaseous environment in that package, okay? If there's oxygen present, we exhaust the oxygen and we pump back in a combination of other gases like nitrogen and carbon dioxide. That reduces the oxygen in the package and thereby reduces the rate of deterioration. Now many of you, I'm guessing most of you, have, have, have had products that have been modified atmosphere packaged. And we'll take a look at that in just a second here. And again, what we do here is extend the shelf life of the food by reducing that oxygen environment in the package. And Dr. Hotchkiss has done a lot of the early work on this technology and I'm sure we'll be sharing a little bit more with you when he speaks to us later in the course. You've all had fresh, as he likes to put it in quotes, tortellini. These fresh tortellini are actually modified atmosphere packed. If you look at that package, it's very substantial. It's a moisture barrier. And the atmosphere in that package is way different than what you and I think it is. And what's on the front of that package? What does it say? Anybody know what's on the front of that package? Anybody had this product from Wegmans? What's the front of the package say? used by XX date or freeze, okay? They clearly want you to use this by a, a specific time frame to be sure that the product is still maintaining that atmosphere over time, okay? Now here's another interesting one that most people don't think about. What happens if your spice rack is near the window in your kitchen? Do you ever notice what happens to the color of those spices? They get a little squirrely looking. They don't look like they did when you bought them. That's because light destroys color of food. It destroys a variety of vitamins, and this is important. A, C, and riboflavin are very, very light sensitive, okay? And light can also oxidize lipids and proteins. It can cause off flavors, that should be off flavors, not of flavors, cause off flavors. You're gonna get surface discoloration of meats, and last but not least, we've got to use packaging to exclude light. Now, I want to ask you a, about a couple of examples out there. What types of foods are packaged in such ways to avoid light deterioration? What's that? I'm sorry? I'm sorry? Hood milk. What, what's the package look like? Okay, it's an opaque bottle. It's made with titanium dioxide. It looks like a bleach bottle, doesn't it? Okay, there's a reason for that. We're going to get to that in a minute. That's a good one. What other types of products are packaged? Beer. Beer. You guys don't have any experience with that, I'm sure. But how is beer packaged differently? Uh, the brown bottles keep out UV light for some extent. Okay, where did you learn that? Reading on the internet, okay. He's absolutely right. Why do you think beer is in green or brown bottles? Because if you expose beer to light, what's gonna happen is you're gonna cause a skunky flavor to the beer and you're not gonna like to drink that. And I'll show you how that works in just a second. Excellent. Somebody else had their hand up, yes. Okay, put your paper around meat and fish. What's another one that you folks consume, I'm sure, a reasonable amount of? Any thoughts? All these are great examples, by the way. All right, let's take a look. It's beer and wine, savory snacks. Did you ever look at potato chip bags? Have you seen any clear ones? 
I don't think so. There may be some, some tortilla chips in clear bags, but most of them are what? They're in foilized, multi-laminate bags, and part of the reason those great graphics are there is to prevent light from getting to them. And as this gentleman correctly said, and you said milk for sure, but let's look at this. Light photooxidizes beer and causes light-struck flavor. Light-struck flavor, it's another way of saying skunky beer. And I have a little video clip that I downloaded, but I couldn't get embedded into my presentation, so I'm going to show it to you next time. If you'd like to see it, go to the Sam Adams samadams.com and you go to the download section and there's all of their ads and there's a 30 second spot that says protect your beer. Now I'm not advocating drinking and I'm not advocating Sam, Ad Sam Adams as a brand over somebody else but their commercial really talks about two things. It talks about light oxidation and it talks about oxygen degradation of products. And I, I want you to look at that, and I'll try to show it to you next time. Anyway, most beer bottles are packaged in brown because brown is the best for excluding light. Green is next best. And there are a few beers that are packaged in clear bottles, right? Yeah? No? What are they? I'm sorry? Corona and? And? Miller Genuine Draft. Exactly right. These companies have figured out how to do this, and I'm going to show you how to do this. What causes the bitterness in beer? Hops. And that's what hops looks, look like. They grow in trellises in the Pacific Northwest and in Europe. They produce the bitterness in beer. And what happens here is when you have light and you have riboflavin, we talked about riboflavin being very light sensitive, and you have components in the hops called isohumolones, okay? And you have sulfur-containing compounds, usually some amino acids in there. So you get a combination of riboflavin, the isohumolones, and amino, uh, sulfur-containing amino acids, and you shine some light on it. What, what happens? You produce a compound with skunky beer flavor. That's what it looks like to chemists, okay? And this will not be on the final exam, but here you see riboflavin, you see visible light, you see cysteine, which is a sulfur-containing amino acid, and this is the compound that causes the skunky flavor in beer. So this is very practical stuff out here. That's why we package in certain types of, of packaging materials. Other causes of food deterioration related to light, and this young lady said it, Hood Dairy has a package that's opaque, that prevents light from getting at the milk. But this is really startling. Milk in blow-molded polyethylene containers. That's the gallon jugs and the half-gallon jugs. When they're stored in a lighted display case, for 24 hours, there'll be a 90% reduction in added vitamin A and an 8% loss in riboflavin. Wow. Now, why isn't that such a concern to us is probably because we have varied diets. We eat a lot of different food products, and we get some of these nutrients from other places. But that's a significant loss. 90% is unbelievable. So clearly, again, packaging like that, if you're really concerned about this vitamin A loss and you're concerned about the riboflavin loss, what do you do? If you don't, if you don't or can't buy hood container milk, what do you do? What's your alternative? carton, paperboard, okay? The, the, the paperboard container is a great way to exclude light from the dairy product, okay? So, for every 10 degrees C rise in temperature, enzyme reaction rate doubles. So, let's get your thoughts on that question. And read the question carefully. Okay, let's see. And the answer is 
It's 10 degrees C, not F, okay? Little trick question just to get you thinking a little bit, okay? All right, so it's false. All right, everything deteriorates over time, except for some very fine red wines and some uh, cheeses. Think about this, even we deteriorate with time. So all we're trying to do here is, through processing and packaging and storage, extend that shelf life just a little bit longer. But you know what? We can't extend that shelf life indefinitely. There's a finite point where, boom, the product just totally deteriorates and spoils, becomes inedible. And again, very simplistic overview here. Foods from the time they're harvested, slaughtered, or, or manufactured are on a downward sked, okay? So obviously we want to prolong this deterior, we, we want to avoid the deterioration of the food. We want to provide some extended shelf life for a while, but nothing lasts indefinitely. Canned foods will last several years, but beyond that, uh, not too good. So remember that time is, is our enemy. So if we look at all of this, we have to remember that one of these just doesn't occur in isolation. Many of these factors are in operation at the same time. Multiple forms occur. We might have some insect deterioration, and then humidity, and then temperature, and then microbes, etc. So remember that this is going to depend on the nature of the food item, the components that it has. It's also going to be dependent on the environmental conditions out there the temperature, the humidity, how it's stored, et cetera. And we'll talk a little bit more about this in a moment. So what we're trying to do with preservation technologies is to slow these deteriorative processes down. That's very important. So let's ask ourselves the question then. Why do we process foods when we know everybody wants fresh, wholesome, right off the, right off the vine, right out of the garden products? Why do we preserve and process foods? Why do we do that? This is where I need your help. Why do we preserve and process foods? What are we doing? Yes? Okay, so we can ship them possibly, make them available at a later time. We might not want to have all the tomatoes when they come harvested in July and August and September. We might want to have them in January and February. Okay. Why else do we process? So we're going to extend shelf life. Anybody else? Come on, guys. Yes? Okay, we're going to add some things to it, for sure, to change the form, to maybe improve the nutrient content. Any other reasons? Yes? It's going to protect the food. Uh, remember, we might add some safety factors in here as well. Any others? Yes? Okay, possibly. Absolutely. Let's take a look. First of all, we want to prevent this deterioration and spoilage as much as we can. We certainly want to destroy those spoilage organisms, those enterococci, those pseudomonads, uh, and others. We want to inhibit those enzymes from continuing that, that ripening process, that deteriorative process. We certainly want to improve the quality attributes, and that's where the fortification comes in. We want to change the form of the food in some cases and make it more palatable. Remember my wheat berry example in the second lecture and the, and the wheat flakes? Obviously, most people are going to choose the more convenient form, the processed form, which is, which is for, fortified, et cetera, okay? Other reasons. One is that we do want to extend the shelf life. No, no surprise there. Another one is we want to make the product safer. We want to, to destroy the pathogenic microorganisms, the disease-causing organisms like we heard about in the video, Salmonella, E. coli 0157, and a whole bunch of bad actors we'll talk about a little bit later in the course. And last but not least, we want to provide some convenience, too, to make the form of that food a little bit more convenient. So how are we going to do this? What types of preservation technologies are out there and have we used over the years? Well, heat preservation is an important one. We've going to look, we're going to look a little bit at cold preservation and dehydration, fermentation, chemical preservation, and food irradiation. So let's take a look at some of the history related to food deterioration. Why isn't it coming up, Renee? Uh, Renee's my uh, 
technical expert here. Everyone, I'm Kara O'Brien. Welcome to this special edition of Desk. Having large amounts of food on hand played an important role in military campaigns as well. During his reign, Napoleon Bonaparte constantly found that providing food for his soldiers was often a harder task than fighting the battles. Napoleon famously stated that an army travels on its stomach, soup makes the soldier. In fact, Napoleon was so committed to finding a way to preserve food for his soldiers that a prize of 12,000 francs was offered to the first person who could invent a method to successfully preserve food. After years of trying, a Parisian named Nicolas Appert came up with an idea that worked. Appert successfully preserved food by partially cooking it, sealing it in glass bottles with a cork, then immersing the bottle in boiling water. This process allowed the remaining air to be expelled through the boiling process, keeping the food fresh. A pear's preservation technique proved so successful that he was awarded the 12,000 franc prize by Napoleon himself in 1810. This represented the origination of the modern canning process for food. Not to be outdone, by about 1812, the British Army was preserving food in tin cans rather than in glass bottles. Tin cans were much more durable than glass and proved to be easier to store. By about 1818, the British Navy was storing over 40,000 pounds of food preserved in cans on board its ships, keeping crews well-fed and healthy. This military use eventually trickled down into everyday civilian life, helping the general public live healthier lives as well. The preserving process became even more widespread in the late 1800s with Frenchman Louis Pasteur's work in germ theory. This theory proved that tiny living microbes caused food to spoil. In his research, Pasteur determined he could gently heat foods and liquids to a temperature that would kill the microbes without altering the taste. Then chilling the foods and liquids would prevent any remaining microbes from multiplying. This process is now known as pasteurization. Food preservation became even more interesting with the development of spaceflight. In order to undertake manned missions in microgravity, NASA scientists needed to understand the relationship. I think you get a good sense of the historical uh, issues related to um, heat preservation, and let me just kind of go through them very quickly. Uh, basically, it was the late 1700s. Uh, France was at war with most of Europe, and the problem was that most of the troops ate salted meat and bread, not a very healthy diet. And what was happening was other foods spoiled very, very quickly. They didn't have good preservation technologies. The soldiers would die in a scurvy and uh, other diseases because of this horrendous diet. And what happened then was uh, they, they really needed some palatable food. So Napoleon said, okay, I'm going to offer a prize of 12,000 francs to the person who comes up with a method to preserve food. And there's a young man by the name of Nicolas Appert who was a French confectioner and chef, and he developed the technique that you heard about in the NASA video, and he won the prize in 1809, and Napoleon gave it to him in 1810. Basically, what he did was, and they described it very well, he put food in cork-stoppered wide mouth bottles, and you see them very, very rudimentary here with a, a wire bale on it to hold the cork in. He boiled it in water, and then he wrote a paper, like any good scientist, I guess, and he wrote The Art of Preserving Animal and Vegetable Substances for Many Years. This was the advent of the canning process. And Nicholas Appert is known as the father of canning. Now, it wasn't until 50 years later that Pasteur came up with the germ theory and proved that microorganisms were the major cause of food spoilage. So I think you can see how all this plays out. Today, we have very interesting technologies to produce cans 
uh, canned foods, and I think I will uh, end there, and we'll pick it up next time. Have a good rest of the day, and we'll see you on Thursday.